you've been for the past couple of years, you've gone deep on the investigative journalism. Um, so how did you decide to take that path? Because I, I see a lot of the stuff you're doing. I'm like, man, this is a, this is, this is going way down the, you know, really going into the rabbit hole. So yeah, what, way what, down what, in the rabbit hole now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, what, what inspired you to, what inspired you to go there? Such a good question. I mean, it, in some ways it was just failure. I mean, I was, I had, I had a nonprofit. I left a, I had, I had a think tank that I co-founded in the early 2000s. I left in 2016. I was trying to save nuclear plants, which were being closed down. I had some supporters but they did not like what I was saying because I was I was not willing to the official. If you're there's this very small pro nuclear movement in the okay. world, and and the official orthodoxy is that climate change is is going to destroy. It's apocalyptic. That we need um, advanced, you know, radically futuristic nuclear like we don't have yet. We need Bill Gates to invent some magic new nuclear, and that it has to work really well with renewables. My view was climate change is real, but it's not the end of the world. Um, the nuclear we have is fine. It's more mm -hmm. than fine. It's actually better because we actually know how to run these plants. We don't need some new Bill Gates type plant. And that we don't really need renewables. If you have nuclear, then you don't need renewables and renewables are bad for the environment. So this was a unpopular with the tiny little group of donors that are pro-nuclear environmentalists. Long story short, I basically lost all my supporters from 2016 to 2019, mm -hmm. except for really one. And I saw the writing on the wall and I thought, I'm just going to have to say all of my contrarian views in a single book and hope that it sells. And that's what Apocalypse Never was. It was like a kind of Hail Mary pass. It was like, I'm just going to have to find a way to make a living as a, just somebody that is an, a public intellectual, basically. I mean, mm -hmm. I had been, I'd always been writing. I've been doing journalism since I was 15, so it wasn't like it was new. But I had sort of been a think tank guy. And that, and with Apocalypse Never, it was like, all right, here we go. We're going to try to make this work. It did work 2020 and then San Francisco. And then the other thing that happened is that Substack uh, shows up, mm. which is this, this platform that allows people to subscribe. And I had a lot to say because on the one hand, you write, you write two books and a lot of it's in the book, but a lot of people don't read the book or there's stuff in the book that I wanted to surface and I wanted to hook it to news. So I started doing more reporting and writing and Substack just started, I started making money on Substack. Mm -hmm. And, you know, by basically by the end of 2022, I had, you know, half a million dollar a year in subscribers. Amazing. Um, we're at, you know, um, over a million a year now in revenue, which is crazy mm. because you would never... I mean, I think of it as like, it's really historic moment. I mean, if you think of like the, the writers and intellectuals have been working for the guys that own the printing presses yes. for hundreds of years, even though if you can just use some Marxist language, I am the means of, of intellectual production. Mm -hmm. Like I don't like, so, but it took this technological revolution called the internet and it took really 20 25 years after the internet, if you kind of look at the rise of Substack, which was also a cultural shift, people started wanting to pay, people being willing to pay for mm -hmm. news. Now people do pay for news with subscriptions, but they'd be willing to pay one person for, you know, five bucks a month. Sure. Yeah. You know, people can afford that. And the technology got good enough and became easy enough. So it started working and I started playing with the medium. I'm still playing with it a lot. Um, but it became, I started working on a, a particular style of, of the substack where like I would call it three act structure in the first act. I often would like to take something that's out there that people are talking a lot about and either give you some new revelation about it or debunk something kind of hard hitting investigative stuff. I love the classic, you know, my classic style would be like everybody says X, but it's not X, it's mm -hmm. Y. And then you go, and that's like act one. And then I'm like, well, then if it's if it's Y, not X, then how come everybody thinks it's X? And then you go into act two and you can sort of explain why everybody got it wrong. And then act three, sort of how they get it right. So I started playing with that and it started working more broad latent over. But, you know, then and then the Twitter files led to basically discovering mm. massive abuses of power by multiple agencies, including during COVID, just any kind of abuse of power that you could imagine you would see, you know, um, spying without warrants, uh, censorship, 
um, you know, basically misrepresenting vaccine data, mm -hmm. making claims that were obviously wrong. Like if you get the vax, then you won't be you won't get sick and you won't transmit it. People, you know, people claiming that the lab leak theory was racist, but somehow it wasn't racist to say that it came from people eating bats in the market, <laughs> you know. And so the so I got so I yeah, I've loved um I've I've really just loved coming and doing it full time. I never thought I would be able to be an investigative journalist full time yeah. because it's 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 never been a lucrative industry. Mm -hmm. But I love it so much. I'm actually going to give a speech. I'm now uh I'm sort of the first endowed chair at the University of Austin. Awesome. And I'm giving a speech uh in a week and a half there called Empiricism as the antidote to ideology. And I'm somebody that loves ideas. Like I love Nietzsche. I love I love big ideas. I love you know Foucault and Hegel, or I hate them, but I you know like, I like talking <laughs> I gonna, about I was ideas. Say controversial, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I love talking about ideas. But but what really changes things are investigations. What really changes things are when you are like you know no like. Fewer people are dying from natural disasters than ever before. It's mm. not the end of climate change. Is obviously not the end of the world. Or harm reduction is not resulting in, in fewer deaths. It's resulting in more of them. I mean, I love – I think the way things change is by being investigative and by revealing new truths and then also, you know, finding new ways to express them. But so, yeah, for me, it's um, – you know, when you guys came in here chasing a story about yeah. about the beginning of the, trush, the Trump uh, – Russia collusion stuff and – being able to reveal new things, um, like that's that really is, that really gets me excited. So it's that's I think awesome. it comes really it comes like a, it's like a yeah it's like the thrill of I'm a neophile in the sense I like new things. Mm -hmm. I like to when I say I don't find myself wanting to keep going out there and repeating myself on nuclear power after a while. It's like I think people know what Michael Schellenberger thinks of nuclear power. It's yeah. not that interesting.